if you imagine this huge storm, so there's waves coming in, crashing all over us, more and more, more, more information. Now, through this big storm, you look out into the distance and there you see standing on a, on a green hill is a knight in, a, in, in shining armor. And that knight in shining armor is the vaccine. You know, we've got all this problem, but my God, if we got the vaccine, then everything would be solved. And uh, we would be able, all be able to be vaccinated, we'd be safe, and it would all go away. Uh, we're told by the experts that it's 18 months. My God, that's much too long. It's too long. So where does it lie? What is the truth? Is it, why does the vaccine have to take 18 months to make? If it comes, will it be the solution that we all hope for, that magic bullet that's going to you know, make this pandemic a thing of the past that we don't have to worry about it. And I thought we'd just, just discuss this. I'd first like to just touch on what is a virus, because there's so much talk about viruses. So a virus, and if you understand what a virus is, and then you understand how a body reacts to the virus, then you will fully understand what a vaccine is, and then we can talk about what, how to make it. So a virus is the most pared down thing that could be alive. It's an interesting thought. It is what, it, what a virus is made up of is one little strand of DNA or RNA surrounded by a capsule made out of protein, which is usually spherical. So you have this little sphere of protein with a wee bit of DNA and RNA, just one strand and it's quite a short strand. That's it, nothing else. So if you look at the coronavirus, it is RNA. The difference, what is RNA and DNA? It's the nucleic acid. So RNA stands for ribonucleic acid and DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. So it's the same thing as ribonucleic acid, only it's lacking in oxygen. We have, in every cell of our body, we have DNA. And it's inside the nucleus of our cells. And we have RNA, which carries messages. That's a messenger RNA. So we have both in our cells. Now, what the DNA does in our cells is it ours is double stranded the coronavirus and other viruses are single stranded and what the dna does is two things it is it's packed full of the most amazingly complex information so it's an information template the DNA has vast amounts of information, but it turns little bits on and it turns the bits on that say, this is a liver cell and now it's time to divide. So it divides, the double strand separates, it divides and makes a new cell using the information in the DNA. So every time the cell divides, which is 99.9% .9 of the time, even more, it makes a liver cell or it makes a kidney cell or makes a skin cell. So it's the first thing that DNA does. It is there to, uh, to really police and make sure that the division is correct. This and enables the whole thing. The second is once you've got your liver cell, the DNA has information on it, which then it uses to say, right, a liver cell does this, this, and this. It makes these proteins, it makes these fats, it does this and this and this. And the DNA contains all that information and it keeps sending out, okay, do this, do that, do the other. So it runs the cell. So therefore we need DNA for replicating, to keep alive, to make the same cells, and we need DNA to actually run the cell. Now, you've got a tiny little single strand of RNA in a capsule floating in a bit of 
sputum that somebody has coughed out. It floats in the breeze. You breathe, or oh, somebody, not you, somebody breathes it in. And what it does, it gets sucked in, it comes down into your lung, and then it, the little, the tiny little virus particle, touches, gets caught in the mucus, touches against the cell membrane, the wall that's lining. And what it then does is it penetrates. Those little spiky things seem to help in some way. And it then penetrates into the cell, leaving the capsule behind. Now you have a little bit of RNA, single strand, floating around in your massive cell with all this powerful DNA and all the stuff happening. And then the most remarkable thing happens. That little strand of RNA somehow hijacks the DNA in your cell to start making and replicating itself. So your DNA then kind of forgets all the other things that it should be doing and it starts making single strands of RNA. So it's multiplying now inside your cell using your DNA to do that. And it also then somehow persuades your DNA to start making this protein capsule, which is astonishing. So you start this, your cell, which is massive compared to the virus, starts making Replica replicating the same virus particle. We are making that for it. And until you have maybe 10,000 little virus particles inside the cell, the cell by this stage is totally clogged and it bursts. And now you have 10,000 virus particles which go wandering off looking for another cell to do the same thing. And this is how you get an explosion of, of what the virus does. It's actually using our cells to replicate itself. And it is very quickly with a logarithmic type of explosion in numbers going to overwhelm us and destroy us. So how does our body cope? Well, what we do is on the wall of the, on that protein wall, each virus has a particular set of proteins, which is completely unique to that virus. It's like every coronavirus has a particular face, and that face is called the antigen. Now, in the beginning, it sneaks in, starts multiplying, destroying cells, and your body says, oh my God, what's going on? Gracious me. So we have a police force and the police force floats along and it comes along to, and it says, ah, now there is a face I don't know. There is an antigen I've never met before. And it looks like it's attacking me. So it spends a little while trying to sort out what it is and rushes off to start to make antibodies to the antigen, which are very specific to the antigen. It's just that face, that virus, that conformation of proteins that the body, your, your immune system is making the antibodies to. It takes a little while, which is what's called the incubation period. In the incubation period, we are full of virus multiplying. We can spread it like crazy. And then your body says, ah, I've got you sorted. And it starts to attack the virus. When it attacks the virus, you start running a fever. And then depending what the virus does, you will uh, you, you'll get a cough. You, you, you may have runny eyes. You uh, may have a diarrhea. You may have a fantastic rash. All of these are a mixture of your reaction, your body's complex reaction to that particular virus. And we say, ah, you've got the measles, ah, you've got the flu, ah, you've just got a cold, or ah, you've got coronavirus, you've got COVID-19 disease. So your body now has a memory, it'll recognize the face of that virus, and if somebody now coughs over you later, once, once it's killed the virus, which it does 
a lot of the time, but you know, with this virus, it may not. Once you've got through it, then if you come into contact with it again, the virus enters, it does what a virus does, which is enter the cell, start multiplying, poof, the first, your first cell pops, you've got 10,000 virus particles, and your immune system says, ah, I know you, and it zaps it, so you don't get ill. Now you have immunity. So recognizing that process, now you can start to see where does the vaccine come in? Well, what the vaccine does is that if you could put the virus particle or some part of the virus into your body in a way that it doesn't cause illness, but your immune system says, oh, what's that face? Ah, oh, yes, yes, I'm going to make, and your immune system then makes antibodies specific to that virus, to the antigen on the virus, and it did that without you becoming ill, then what you would have is immunity because the next time someone coughed with coronavirus and it got in, your system would say, ah, oh, yes, I know that face, and zap it. So <clears throat> that's what a vaccine is. It's a great idea. And it first started in the uh, early 1800s. There was a guy called Edward Jenner who um, did something that is astonishingly, it was firstly brilliant, but secondly, amazingly unethical, like if you think about it today. So what happened is he recognized that um, there was, at, when he was living, there was smallpox was a scourge. People would either die from smallpox or end up with terrible scars on their face if they lived. So it was, and it was right rife. But what he noted was that milkmaids hardly ever got smallpox. And he also, because he was a physician, recognized that maybe the reason milkmaids didn't was there was something called cowpox, which was gave you pox, which, are, which were like little uh, weeping blisters on your face, on your skin. It gave you the pox very mildly and may actually give you immunity. So he, it, it, so that you don't get the, the actual illness. So what he did was he went along and he took some pus from a, 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 somebody who had cowpox he took a little boy who was, I would imagine, from the peasant class, and he inoculated, he made up that word actually, he inocul inoculated him by scratching his skin and putting the pus into the, into the scratch, and the little boy got cowpox. Once he was finished the cowpox, he then did something mind-bogglingly awful, he found someone with smallpox, took the pus from that and inoculated the smallpox into this little boy. Luckily enough for the little boy, the cowpox did give him immunity and he didn't get ill. So Jenna thought, ah, fantastic. And then he made the first vaccine, which is he got lots and lots of cowpox and he inoculated people around him, including himself, and none of them, or very few of them, they got the cowpox, but they didn't get the smallpox. Uh, and so then what happened, if you fast forward 100 years, is that people thought, right, well, what happens if we take this smallpox, this cowpox vaccine, if we, what happens if we take the cowpox virus, and if we inoculate animals with it, and pick out the animals who have, who get the least sick. What would happen if we could actually get this virus to change so that it is still like the smallpox, but it doesn't even give you any pox on it? And that's what they did. So they found an animal, which is called now an animal model. So we're talking about how vaccines are actually made. And they inoculated the cowpox into this animal and then they picked out the animals that were the least sick and then they kept inoculating and then at the end they made a vaccine which 
is live. It's a virus just like the smallpox. It's got a similar face on the outside, similar antigenic profile, but it doesn't cause disease. And they started then making tons of this and inoculating worldwide. And what happened was that, for, that the smallpox was already declining, but the vaccine certainly helped. And what happened is over a number of years, the smallpox stopped becoming a scourge and then kind of disappeared, which is wonderful. So the vaccine was, this is the great vaccination um, <clears throat> success. So then they looked around and they said, well, if you can do it for that, you can do it for other things. So they've done the similar process with a TB and they've done a similar process um, with polio. And they made the, the a polio virus, which doesn't cause uh, polio itself, but which, um, uh, but which has the same antigenic profile. And when I was a child, I remember you used to get a few drops on your tongue and that was the polio that was part of the immunization schedule. The good thing about this is that it's a live virus and it gets into your body in the same way that the normal virus that you're trying to uh, prevent. So in other words, if it's droplet spread, they drop it on your tongue and then your immune system responds by a full strong immune response. It says, oh, what is this? Ah, yes. And then it makes IgA against it because it's going through mucous membranes, it makes IgG, which is, so these are the kinds of immunoglobulins. So you get a really strong um, uh, immunogenic response, which gives you lifelong immunity, which is really, really good. That's the positive side. The negative side is that if the virus can change to become benign, over time, the virus can also change to become uh, virulent again. And so this is always a concern, especially when you're immunizing millions of people, that in fact, the smallpox, if you go back to the smallpox vaccine, it in certain people caused vaccinia, which was a disease. And if you were, say, on immunosuppressants or you had a certain uh, allergies in your body, you may, more people died from vaccinia than died from smallpox in the last few years of the vaccine. So this is always the problem. And so the, po so the next step, the other next thing that you can do is that you take the vaccine and you kill it. So you, you inactivate it. So what you still have is the protein coat, but you've either irradiated it or you've uh, poisoned it somehow, or you've, uh, um, heated it and therefore it's now dead but you've still got the same antigen and you use a killed virus injecting that into people now that's a lot safer because it's not going to turn into a nasty disease but it doesn't have the same strong antigenic res uh, immunological response and therefore people can be vaccinated and still become ill if they have been vaccinated, it, the illness tends to be a lot less severe and gives you a degree of protection. This is like the flu vaccine. This is what happens. So, but the problem with it as well is that you need lots and lots of virus. You need to be able to grow the virus. And that's difficult. You can kill, you can take a subunit and with, um, which is a small part of the outer coat. And with coronavirus, it's just the little spiky things. They are full of this antigen. And so you could take that. And then, of course, one virus particle can give you a lot of antigen and you can make a lot more vaccine with it. So that's another way of doing it. There are two other uh, ways that you can do it. And um, so, but, but before I discuss those, at present, because we're in the middle of, of this corona uh, epidemic, 
There are 35 companies at the moment who are rushing ahead. A lot of them are huge private companies and a number of them are academic institutions. The prize is massive, potentially massive. If you can make a vaccine, my goodness, you could, you could see, you could kind of print your own money. So um, people are rushing along. And um, I'm just going to outline the stages of making a vaccine. So the first thing is you need to be able to recognize what the bug is, yes. Then you need to be able to grow the bug, which is difficult. You then need an animal model, which you can inject into to see whether, to learn more about how the bug actually works, what it does, and to then try different types of vaccines to see whether they are first safe and then secondly effective. Once you've spent, and it's usually six to eight months doing this, once you've found the animal model and you do this, then you start phase one, where you have a hundred slightly nervous volunteers who say, okay, stick it in. And what you're learning with that hundred is that you're learning, is this safe? And you need to watch them for a few months to see what kind of reactions they get. Then you go to phase two, where you've got a few hundred people, and there you're injecting to carry on to check safety, but now you're seeing, does it really make a quality antibody in the amounts that will give you proper effective cover? And then there's phase three, where you take a few thousand people and do the same thing. And each of these takes months and months and months, such that the average time is between two to five years, and a lot of vaccines need 10 years. So the minimum, minimum, minimum would be two years, and that's been very rarely. So, so, so now the experts are saying, but hang on, we can do it in 18 months. And you can see why, because it's complex. What has happened with coronavirus is that a particular Boston-based company has used a new technology. And the new technology is that you take a tiny little bit of, the, of that little spiky thing that's full of the antigen protein that will make our body recognize this is coronavirus, and you insert it into a yeast cell or a bacterial, a yeast or a bacterium, and you insert it in such a way that when that bacterium or the yeast continues to multiply, and if you think of yeast, uh, you know, you, you just put it in the oven and you just get the yeast frothing up, you get it rises in, in bread. So yeast multiplies like there's no to tomorrow. So, but every time, once you've inserted this little bit of antigen into the yeast, when it divides, the new, new, the new yeast cells have on its surface, they look like the coronavirus. They've, in, they've integrated that antigen into its wall. So now we have a yeast that looks like coronavirus. It's got the coronavirus face on it, but it doesn't cause illness. And you can multiply it like there's no tomorrow. So this is called recombinant. And this company have made this vaccine called Moderna, that's their name, and they, and they have already made a recombinant um, vaccine. And I, I actually don't know whether they skipped completely or shortcut putting it into animals because they already are injecting it into the phase one into a hundred people, which is astonishing. Now, uh, this is um, fantastic if it turns out to be safe and effective. It's fantastic, but it's used. It's using new technology, which has, I think, been used once before which has, because once you're through phase three, you've then got to get the regulatory body to agree that this is safe and effective, and they're very, very conservative. Um, so 
they're using a technology that's brand new, that's relatively untried. They're fast tracking it through the safety steps. At the end of it, they then, if, if it does turn out, because when you look at all vaccines, you start off with a lot of people trying. A lot of the other companies are using different technology. Some of them are killing it. Some of them are taking subunits. And one of them is also using another brand new technology, which is to take the RNA and multiply that because our body also recognizes the RNA. So one of the companies is doing that, another kind of recombinant um, therapy. And they're all rushing ahead. What we hope is that A, it's effective and much more, well, as important is that it is safe. And this is a uh, big question marks at the moment. And if you rush along, you may actually find that one or both of those things do not happen. If we are supremely lucky, the one of them will create a vaccine which is safe and effective within a year to 18 months. That would be unprecedented, but it may happen. That is in fact, then that's magnificent, but now there are a number of other practical problems. The first is that you've got to make not a lot of virus, you've got to make vast amounts because why? You've got to vaccinate billions of people. Number one, can one company do that? Very unlikely. So if, it, if the technology is then spread to other companies or countries and academic institutes, are they all going to do the same thing? Maybe, maybe not. So that's our first problem is making enough. The next problem is, which turns out it, with most vaccines to be the biggest problem is getting the vaccine to the people that need it is distribution. Now distribution involves two things. It involves firstly, what's called it, which is, which is a, what's called a supply chain. You make the vaccine under very stringent, uh, controls, it comes out, the vaccine has to be uncontaminated. There's been uh, some horror stories with contaminated vaccine. The vaccine then has to be just this pure vaccine. Now the vaccine, when it comes out, will have very specific rules. It will, you, you'll know that if it gets into the sun or if it gets too hot or too cold or something happens with it, it will actually become inactive. So on the supply chain from the company to into the truck that carries it to the airplane or the boat, all the time, the supply chain, it has to be kept exactly at the right temperature and humidity. Everything has to be right. It then gets handed over to, I don't know, some country in, in, in Central Africa. Central Africa, the people taking it have to follow that supply chain bumping along a road through a jungle somewhere. At the end of it, they've got to use exactly the right diluent. They've got to use the right amount. They can't use needles and reuse needles. <laughs> they've got to use a new one every time. They've got to draw up exactly the right amount. They've got to be sterile. So you can see all along the supply chain, when you're dealing with billions of people, how, and one thing can go wrong, and at the end of it, the person gets a vaccine, which is either inactive or is contaminated or both, even though the first one was good. So that's, that's our first problem. The second, which turns out to be economic and political, is that because this coronavirus, this COVID-19 disease is not over by any means. It hasn't hit Africa yet. It hasn't really hit South America, partly because they don't get as many planes coming in. And it may well be there, but we don't know because they don't have the infrastructure to do the testing to say, oh my God, this person didn't die of AIDS, they died of coronavirus, complicating their AIDS. So once, unfortunately, and this is, I don't need to be a, a prophet of doom, once the virus starts to spread through countries which have 
tremendous overcrowding, which have poverty, which have a lot of other diseases, and which do not have the infrastructure to be able to actually diagnose the disease and treat it properly, those countries are going to be of, at greatest need for a vaccine that is safe and effective and are going to have to be taught how to use it properly. But who pays for it and who gets it there? And what kind of political things are going to get in the way? I mean, at the moment, masks are needed and the Trump administration is blocking 3M from sending masks to their neighbors, Canada, because they say we want it. So this kind of political interference in the production and the distribution of the vaccine will turn out to be another huge block in this, uh, you know, in getting a, a vaccine out to the people that really, really need it. So this is just a quick overview, and it took me ooh, quite a long time to explain what it is is that knight in shining armor truly a knight in shining armor? Will it solve all our problems? And as you see, the answer is question mark, question mark, question mark. If we're supremely lucky, yes. If all goes well, yes. Otherwise, there's any number of things we can trip up on. Thank you very much.